Good evening, ladies and gentlemen. My name is Noshin Premji, and I am the Project and Events Coordinator here at the Institute of Ismaili Studies. It is with great pleasure that I welcome you to this evening's book launch, Command and Creation, a Shi, a Shi Cosmological Treatise, edited and translated by our very own Dr. Dariush Muhammad Poor. A special welcome also to those of you who are joining us online through our live webcast. Tonight's book launch will last approximately one hour and will be followed by light refreshments in the atrium. There will be an opportunity for questions to be asked towards the end of the event. For those of you joining us online, please submit your questions using the Q&A box at the bottom of your screen. We do not have a lot of time allocated for questions, but we will endeavour to get through as many of those as possible throughout the event. A couple of housekeeping rules before we begin. We are not planning on having a fire drill tonight, so if the alarm does sound, please calmly make your way uh, through the doors and downstairs and out of the building through the main uh, entrance and exits. Please also take a moment to ensure that your mobile devices remain on silent or are switched off. Unfortunately, we are not permitted to sell copies of the publication here tonight. However, we have a few copies that we've made available for you to look through, which you'll find on the desk just to my right-hand side. Uh, these are both in hardback and paperback formats. So if you wish to purchase a copy, please take a look at the flyer that's also placed on the desk, and there'll be flyers on your seats available as well. This contains a 20% discount code, uh, so it's a nice little saving uh, from, the, from the paperback edition, if you were to purchase the book from Bloomsbury's website. For those of you uh, who are joining us online, we will send you a copy of that flyer so you won't miss out. It now gives me great pleasure to introduce Dr. Orkan Mirkasimov, who will be moderating this evening's conversations and will be introducing our speakers. Orkan is a senior research fellow at the Institute of Ismaili Studies and the series editor of the Ismaili Texts and Translation series. He is Senior Fellow at the Higher Education Academy and teaches courses on the history of the Islamic world as part of the IIS educational programs. His research and publications address intellectual history of Islam with a focus on Shi and Sufi mystical and messianic trends. Please join me in welcoming Orkan. Thank you. Thank you very much. Uh, thank you, Nushin, for this kind introduction. Uh, and uh, good evening to everyone. It is my pleasure to, uh, to welcome you to this book launch today. Uh, as uh, Nushin mentioned, the book we will be presenting today is Command and Creation, a Persian edition and English translation of uh, Muhammad al-Shahrastani's Majlisi Maktoub. Uh, edited and translated by uh, Dr. Dariush uh, Mohammadpour. Uh, this book is 25th publication, a publication in the Islamic Texts and Translation series, published by the Institute of Ismaili Studies since the beginning of the century. So the, the first book was published in 2000. Right? Uh, the Ismaili Text and Translation Series seeks, uh, as indi indicated by the title, uh, to promote the research on and the knowledge of the Ismaili written heritage uh, by providing uh, high-quality critical editions of the Ismaili texts and of the texts closely related with uh, Ismaili history and doctrines, as well as English translations of uh, these texts making them available to the uh, scholars, to the Ismaili community, and to the broader readership. Uh, Muhammad al-Shahrastani is a familiar figure in the Ismaili text and translation series. His uh, struggling with the philosopher, a refutation of Avicenna's metaphysics, a new Arabic edition and English translation of al-Shahrastani's Kitab al-Musara'a, uh, was published by Wilfred Madlung and Toby Meyer, who is today with us as well. And uh, it was the second publication actually in the uh, Ismaili text and translations. Uh, and this brings me to our discussions uh, today. Uh, let me introduce Dr. 
uh, Darius Mohammadpur, a senior research associate in the Department of Academic Research and Publications, a lecturer for the Department of Graduate St Studies, and the editor of the Ismaili Heritage series uh, publications of the IES. Uh, uh, Darius uh, Mohammadpur is also uh, a fellow of the Higher Education Academy in the UK. Uh, his main area of research, uh, his main area of expertise is Ismaili philosophy and intellectual history. Uh, and uh, Dr. Toby Maya is a senior research associate at the Institute of Ismaili Studies. Uh, where his research and publications have included Shahrastani's critic of Avicenna uh, and uh, Shahrastani's Quran commentary, Keys to the Arcana, uh, covering the introduction and the uh, commentary on the opening chapter of the Quran on uh, Al Fatiha. The first volume of his commentary uh, on uh, Quran chapter 2, uh, Al, -Bakara, Al Bakara, is due to be published later this year. Uh, so let's, uh, uh, to start our discussion today, uh, maybe my first question will be to, to Darius. Uh, uh, Darius, how you came to this uh, idea of working with this particular text of Shahrastani? Were there any, any personal motivation uh, behind this? Yeah, thank you, Orhan. This uh, the text of the Majlis is is a is a book that I've been I've been living with for maybe about thirty years. I was very young when I came across this book in uh, Iran when I was still living in Mashhad. A a friend, Mr. Olam Zamir Shai, who happened to be a graduate of the IAS as well, one of the very early graduates of the IAS. He gave me the text, and at that time, the text was rather undecipherable for me. It was not quite uh, uh, the way that I'm looking at it today, because for the next two decades, I was trying to see Shahristani from a perspective which was fundamentally different from the way I look at it, because all my effort was trying to show that Shahristani had no connection with Ismailis. And it took me another decade to realize that I need to look at the opposite perspective. So... When I was reading the text at the same time, I was comparing the text of Shahristani with the uh, extant material of, of the Nazari Ismaili literature from the Alamut period, including those works attributed to Tusi and the ones which formed the corpus of uh, uh, Nazari Ismaili doctrines, including Sayyid Suluk, uh, Tasavvurat or Ravzai Taslim, and uh, the Haft Bab, which at that time was published by Iwanov and later on until we've got the recent one by uh, edited by Dr. Badr at the IAS. When I was looking through those texts, I was seeing parallels and very close similarity between the kinds of terminologies and the arguments that Shah Hassani was using in these texts and the, uh, and the aff affinity or the similarity was unmistakable. So it was very difficult to tell them apart, but it, I, it was very puzzling for me to see how a a, a, a heresiographer or somebody known as an Ash'ari theologian could share so much with the Nazari Ismailis from a completely different perspective, from a different context. So for quite a long time, it was puzzling to me, and it took me uh, another decade to really make those connections between Shahristani and Ismaili doctrines. Um, uh, thank you. Thank you, Darius. Toby, do you want to add something on your personal connections with, with um, Shahristani? Sure. I, uh, basically, uh, my first big project at the Institute, the aforementioned <coughs> project with Wilfred Madelon on the uh, critique of Ibn Sina, was how I got into it, although that flowed fairly naturally from my doctoral thesis, which I was still completing at the time, um, which was on critiques uh, of Ibn Sina, well, the reception and critique of Ibn Sina. Um, <clears throat> mainly focused on commentaries on the Isharat. Shahrasani's critique, for its part, um, turns out to have a rather distinct point of view, which is Ismailism. I mean, in the sense that he is criticizing Ibn Sina from positions which are demonstrably Ismaili at a deeper level. So this then led fairly naturally to look at the great repository uh, of his 
higher thought is Ismaili thought, which is the sister text to, to, to the Majlis, uh, which is his Quran commentary. So that is how I got into it. Uh, but in terms of personal motivation, I mean, to be very simple about it, it does go back to the Zahir Batin idea. And Shahristani really delivers on this idea that exoteric Islam uh, enshrines at a deeper level um, an esoteric religion. I think Shahristani really articulates that very thoroughly. Mm. Um, yes, uh, thank you. And uh, of course, you, you both already touched on this question and uh, we uh, uh, can have a general idea of why this book is published in, uh, why Shahrastani's books were published in Ismaili text and translations. Do you want to develop a little bit more on the uh, uh, connection of why Shahrastani is important for Ismaili studies? Okay. Well, if I may go first, I think the, the key idea is that for quite a while, I mean, uh, uh, particularly after Guy Mono wrote his, uh, his uh, uh, entry in the Encyclopedia on Shahristani and also the uh, various articles that he wrote, and he was concluding uh, that Shahristani could not have been other than an Ismaili, at, at least towards the end of his life. So the idea that Shahristani could have indeed been a senior figure in the Ismaili Dava was, of course, a fundamental one. But then it's a little bit deeper than that because, uh, as I mentioned a little bit earlier, when you look at the uh, later texts, the texts, the uh, doctrinal and, and philosophical texts which were produced by Nizari Ismailis after the death of Shahristani. Remember that Shahristani lives almost at the end of the life of Hassan al-Sabba and towards the very uh, early years of the life of Hassan II, known as al Azhar al-Salam, who declares the Qiyamah. Now, almost every single text that you find written in the Alamut period by the Nazaris is deeply under the influence of the terminology, the methodology, and the kind of arguments that Shahristani uses both in the Majlis and in the Tafsir, particularly in the Asrar sections of the uh, Mafatiul Asrar and Masabiul Abrar. So uh, the Ismaili element of it is that if you want to understand what is going on in the Ismaili doctrines in the Alamut period, it's just a natural entry point of being able to figure it out. The second point that uh, was particularly important for me because it was, was the doctrine of Qiyamat. Because apart from the, the uh, uh, primary sources of the post-Qiyamat era, which is after al Salam's time, we have got a text which comes immediately before the declaration of the Qiyamat. It's as if we have a blueprint, as if we have a map of what is being unfolded in the era of resurrection and, and explained in more detail by, uh, by, by the Ismaili Imam. Now those particular uh, terms, the, vo the vocabularies, the terminologies, the, the dyads in particular, I think uh, Toby would be able to expand a little bit more on that, are those which are peculiarly Ismaili. Uh, there are some scholars who have suggested, well, it, uh, other uh, communities could have shared these ideas. But the more I look at the particular historical period in which Aristani was writing, I find it extremely difficult to find any other community other than Nizari Ismailis to have shared and have used and have deployed this repository of terms to, to elaborate on the doctrines. Toby, if you want to add anything on the <clears throat> dyads? I'll come on to the diets in a sec, but the, um, I think the thing which has to be sort of uh, a preface to what we're saying is his, is Shahrasani's wider profile in, in Muslim thought, in, in Muslim intellectual history. And um, he, by any standards, he was a major figure. He was prominent in the Sunni revival under the Seljuks, um, primarily as a neo-Asharite. And um, the, this is the, the, the revised, slightly more philosophical form of Asharism emanating, it, it is popularly said, from Ghazali. And Ghazali was, of course, Shahrasani's older contemporary. He's also justly famous for his, his uh, world survey of uh, religious and philosophical teachings, which is a reference ever after for people interested in doxography. Uh, so he's a major figure. He's also a Seljuk courtier. He's the head of Sultan Sanjar's chancellery and his confidant and involved in the Nizamiya Madrasas. So by any standards, he is a major figure in wider Islamic thought. So then the full unveiling of Shahristani as an Ismaili 
and uh, more specifically as coming in the first phase of the unfolding of Nizari Ismailism makes him a very serious object of study at the Institute, I would suggest. Yeah. Yes. Uh, uh, thank you. And uh, 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 you, you mentioned that, uh, several ideas of Shahrastani which bring him close to the Shi and particularly Ismaili thought. Uh, can you speak about uh, uh, some prominent Shi ideas in the Majlis? Um, I think the most important element that you find in the Majlis is the necessity and the inevitability of uh, of of a uh, of a rightly guided teacher. So this is the, exactly the same term that. Hassan Sapo uses to refer to the Ismaili Imam, and that is the 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 Muallim Sadiq or the truthful teacher, the truthful instructor. Now, the subject of that that instruction is, of course, the knowledge of God, because he's mentioned this also at the uh, in in the section in the uh, in the Melal when he talks about the Ta'limis, that. Uh, when you ask them, what is it that this teacher teaches you? They would always tell me that this is our God is the God of Muhammad. And then the subject of it is Tawheed. Now, uh, so you've got a combination of the doctrine of Tawheed, the doctrine of Imamat, and that Imamat is uh, particularly when you read the, when you read the Majlis, is that the Shi'i themes of the inseparability of the scripture, in this case, the Quran, and the people from the Prophet's household is one of the most integral elements that you find in the Majlis, but also expressed in the Tafsir as well, because he defines them as twins, which is, which is a different way of saying that famous Sagalain Hadith, which is a very Shi'i theme. And then you come to the doctrine of Qiyamat. So you've got the doctrine of Tawheed, we've got the doctrine of Im uh, Imamat itself, as Imam being the manifestation of God's command, and also the doctrine of Qiyamat. Which is, uh, which, is, which is the very epitome or which is the very uh, core or gist of Ismaili doctrines that all the exoteric aspects of faith have an allegorical, have an esoteric, deeper meaning which is the, the, the uh, fundamental uh, purpose of what you find in, in religion. Uh, thank you. Uh, Toby, do you want to add something on the prominent Shi ideas in Shahrastani works? In Shahrastani in general? Yes. Um, that is a very big question because um, if you look carefully, it's all, it's all over the place. But if you want me to go through the basics of his system and we see how it connects with the Majlis. Yep. Um, so obviously the, the system is, is uh, manifold in its applications, but at its core, I would suggest that it is elegant and rather simple. Um, it consists of these uh, double principles, uh, dyads, one might call them. And um, Shahrastani applies this to, to the interpretation of scripture, to solving central issues of philosophy, to religion in general. And the first and most fundamental, the most foundational of these Double principles is the command and creation, uh, and it's prominent enough in the Majlis for Daryushpur to have uh, titled the Majlis as command and creation in the English translation and his edition. Um, so the, the command is is clearly uh, distinguished by Shahrastani from creation in typical Ismaili fashion. He bases this partly on a verse in the Qur'an, his not the creation and the command. Therefore, the command is separate from creation. Um, it is uncreated. Um, and we really can distinguish two facets to the command. Um, the prescriptive command, which is the familiar sense of God's commandments in the Qur'an to humanity, the theological basis of ethics and law. But I would suggest more philosophically interesting is his idea of the creative command. So you have the prescriptive command and the creative command. And this comes down to the word kun, this idea which is referred to recurrently in the Quran that God projects things into existence and ultimately the universe in entirety through uh, the word be. And uh, 
this is a very familiar uh, focus for reflection in the Ismaili tradition, of course. Shahrastani distinguishes really uh, two things here, the, the mustar and the mazhar. So there's a point of origin, but there is also a manifestation on earth of this metacosmic reality, and that is ultimately the, the imam for Shahrastani. Um, he's, he has a very intriguing interpretation of the, the verses in the Quran on Iblis's refusal to bow down with the angels uh, to Adam, who is the archetype of this idea of the mazhar of the command on earth. And he locates all uh, religious deviations and errors in this Iblisian refusal. And this is a very interesting passage because um, he finally gets to Muslim groupings and he uh, criticizes the Amma for failing to uh, acknowledge this, this, uh, this epiphany of the command. But he also criticizes the, the, the awaiting Shia, a Shia al-Muntazira, for the same thing. They do not acknowledge al-Imam al-Hadir al-Hay al-Qa'im, the, the, the current present Imam Qa'im, and it's impossible to read a section like this without realizing that by a sheer process of elimination, this is an Ismaili talking. Uh, and it baffles me that people still resist this idea that Shahrastani was Ismaili. I would also add that the Quran is very important for Shahrastani and he carries over something of his Ashari sensibility here. The Quran is also uh, a manifestation of the command in our human world. Um, and this, uh, so it's a kind of condensed facsimile is the way I think of it, of the command. Um, and it leads him to some of his most intriguing interpretations because he takes every unit word and letter even of the Quran as giving some kind of access to what he calls the world of the command, uh, which is presupposed by the world of creation. Um, so shall I, Talk about other dyads, I think you should. Yeah, I think that there's one thing that I would add here is that uh, you mentioned this uh, this dialogue between God and Iblis here. Yes. Now, interestingly, I think you, you'd add some more uh, on, on that one. Interestingly, the terms which are used here and the context of the dialogue between Iblis and God is that uh, uh, basically he phrases that conversation between them. He says that, Iblis is accusing God of forcing everybody to imitate. He calls this taqlid because you're asking us to just, without asking any questions, prostrate before Adam. And then this, uh, this, this, is, this, is, this is not uh, basira, this is taslim, this is taqlid. Now, interestingly, uh, in the Melal, towards the very end of that section on the ta'limiyah, I, I mentioned a little bit earlier, he addresses, he includes uh, a few lines uh, seemingly uh, of him being critical of the Ta'limis. And then he quotes, he uses those very, very terms, Taslim, Taqlid, and then Basira. But then in the Majlis, and also I think in the Tafsir, his response is that it is only the followers of Iblis who are the people uh, of, of Taqlid. The people who give their, their, their submission to the Imam, to the Imam al hayy al-Hazir al-Qa'im, are the people of Basira. This is the very gist of insight. And that is connection, connected with the, with the knowledge of God, with the knowledge of Tawheed. So in the Milal, in which he is not openly coming out as an Ismaili, he's mildly criticizing the followers of Hassan Sabbah, but in the Majlis, he's giving his own response. He's responding to his own critique here. Uh, yes. Uh, uh, so you mentioned uh, the, this, uh, the speaking about the connection between uh, Shahrastani and the uh, Ismaili and Shi doctrines. Uh, the, the terms Talim and Qiyama are, of course, uh, key uh, terms also in uh, Nizari Ismaili doctrine. Uh, do you want to elaborate a little bit more on the Shahrastani's understanding of Talim and Qiyama and whether he understood Qiyama 
uh, rationally uh, and what was his vision of uh, uh, his vision of Kiyama whether wow. it, it comes close to the to what we observe in uh, in Nizari doctrine um, well, the, the, this thing about Taklid is very interesting because I think to some extent Shahrastani is carrying uh, over into his Nizari ideas aspects of his Kalam training as an Ashari. Uh, I know this from the Quran commentary. Um, and there he insists that, well, the Kalam idea is basically that a center religion has to begin, begin in a rational inference. I think in a way both the Asharis and above all the Mu'tazilis say this. You have to reflect on the world and infer the existence of a deity, thence a deity who sends prophets, and then you submit to religion. It has to start in a rational inference. This is my understanding of it. So he is very keen to distinguish Ta'lim from servile conformism or taklid because according to the kalam schools religion is invalidated if it's simply founded on servile conformism you can't just accept what a person says because he tells you to accept it um, so shahrastan is very keen to say that ta'lim as you said is a basira it's an intellectual insight it's based on intellectual insight and not taklid um, and he actually brings forward various rational arguments for Ta'lim, quite a few of them, which I find interesting. Um, and I could, I could talk more about those arguments because they're quite interesting. Uh, one of them uh, I mention is, is, is the classic anti-skeptical argument that if you reduce all intellectual viewpoints and deny anything intellectually objective as the skeptic, proposes, it is self-confuting because the skeptic is putting forward that argument as a, a unique exception to this ruling. So it is actually self-confuting. There must be a hierarchy in intellectual viewpoints. Um, so that is one argument. Another is from the observation of hierarchies in nature that uh, human intelligence appears modges to animals um, and we can extrapolate that there are species above human beings uh, whose intellect is modges to human beings and there are other arguments of this kind but he's very keen to show that authoritative instruction that cardinal principle of Ismailism is not the same as taklid yeah, there, there's one thing that I would add is that this, this theme of ta'alim that Shah Rastani develops is found uh, in, in earlier Ismaili doctrine. In particular, one of those uh, examples that uh, very, uh, very exquisitely and very eloquently elaborates on that one is the famous Qasida of Nasr Khosrow's Confessional Ode, a Khan de Basi al Mujahan Gashta Sarasar, in which he goes to the explanation of how he became an Ismaili, in which he just covers exactly the same kind of hierarchy in terms of intellect. But then also it, it revolves around the, the very formulation of the doctrine of Ta'alim by Hassan Sabba, which he includes in his Arabic translation of the Fusul Arba in the Milad. So we've got this narrative of Shah Rastani and also we've got another reformulation of the same doctrine, of the same, the same uh, doctrine of the Ta'alim in Tusi's Sayyid Suluk. So we've got the same narrative narrated by Shah Rastani, by Nasr Khusro, and also later by Tusi in the Sayyid Suluk. Now the key idea is that uh, uh, if, if anybody asks you, how do you know about this uh, fundamental doctrine of la ilaha illallah which is tawheed you would inevitably have to respond it is th that it was through Muhammad who brought this to us because if you could have come to that conclusion on your own then you wouldn't need the prophet then you've already made that claim which is what, what Toby just said it's, it's uh, uh, self-refuting uh, you're, you're actually pulling the rock from under your own feet you're basically claiming that you are a prophet here so that element of Rationality is fundamental to the extent that it reaches the knowledge of God. Anything below that point is the area where intellect is active. Anything above that one is something that requires the instruction. And then he, it, is, it is in this context that he, he offers his, 
refutation against philosophers as well, because uh, in the Sayyid Suluk Tusi offers the same refutation that Shahristani uses in the Majlis, because in the Majlis, Shahristani refutes philosophers generally, he refutes the Mushabbiha, he uh, refutes the, uh, the, the Ashaira as well, so very specifically he mentions these people and said these guys have missed the very key idea of the Tawheed, and that key idea is that you need somebody who knows God without any intermediary, and that person is the Mu'allib, is the Imam of the time, which is the key idea of Ta'lim here. Uh, what about Qiyama? Qiyama. Um, <clears throat> Well, I will be frank. I mean, I have studied the tafsir without this steady reference to the unfolding of uh, the Nizari intellectual tradition. But it clearly does hog forward uh, to the Qiyama and beyond to Tusi and so forth. I mean, the, the way I have come to this uh, is actually through his dyad, another of these uh, double principles, which is the accomplished in the unfolding, al-mafrugh wa al-musta'naf. Um, so the accomplished is the divine point of view, the point of view from which um, realities are fixed in the divine omniscience eternally. And the Mustanaf is the unfolding point of view uh, on the basis of which we experience life with its moral answerability and its cause-effect sequences. And it's a very thought-provoking diet in terms of the philosophy of action. Um, but getting to the Qiyama, I mean, I could talk a lot more about this because Shahrasani has a, a model for this uh, from a hadith of the Prophet where he intervenes um, in an argument between Abu Bakr and Omar about free will and determinism. If everything is fixed and is already accomplished from the divine point of view, what is the point of acting? And the Prophet says um, counterintuitively, both points of view are right. You have to co-affirm the unfolding and the accomplished. And he refers them to this image of a great angel, uh, which has a paradoxical constitution. It's a very thought provoking image. The angel is half fire and half ice. The fire does not melt the ice or the thalj, the snow, and the ice does not uh, extinguish the fire, uh, but it subsists and praises God in its ongoing existence. Um, how this I mean, this also connects, of course, with, with about a third of the Majlis, which is the story of Moses and Khidr, but um, which is all about this distinction. I think how it connects with the Qiyama is that uh, in, uh, in um, his interpretation of verses on the afterlife, Shahrastani makes clear that you can come to a kind of perceptual threshold where you can actually see into the mafrugh, the accomplished, the realities of the Qiyama within the Mustatnef. It's a perceptual threshold that you can reach. You can, you can see into the Qiyama. It's imminent. And um, this actually connects with chapter five of the Haft Bab, where Hassan II is quoted as saying, uh, through the Cheshme Hakikat, you can see the spiritual in the physical perceptual world around you. Um, that is one way in which it harks forward to the Qiyama. Um, but there must be many others actually, when, when, when you have eyes to see it in Shahrastani. Yeah. yeah, if I may add something here. You see, when you talk about the Qiyamah, in the, if you look at the, uh, the literature after uh, Shah Rastani, there is a definition that they give of the, of the era of Qiyamah. The era of Qiyamah is a time when the element is, is a period, when the element of time and the space is removed in worship. So when worship is not time-bound, it becomes the worship of Qiyamah. And when it is time-bound, 
and then you do it at particular times and particular places, uh, it becomes the Sharia. Now, in the conversation between Musa and Khizr, Musa uh, uh, is, is a man of Sharia because everything that he does is time bound. He needs to have evidence in order to act upon his judgment to pass a verdict. Khiz does not need this because he's above time and above space. And as a result, Khiz becomes the man of Qiyamah or Khiz becomes a, a, an allegory or a symbol for the Qa'im. It means that Khiz could actually lift these uh, uh, ritual laws and give them the very core, the very gist, the very soul of the, of, of the worship. And it is precisely here that, he, that the term that Shah Rastani uses is the, the distinction between ta'at and between ma'rifat. So ta'at refers to the pr practice of ritual law in, in terms of the shariat, and ma'rifat has got to do with qiyamat. So uh, the, the characters of, of Moses and Khiz are precisely like the characters of the imam and the prophet working together. Now in this case it becomes the Qa'im who's who's giving them who's giving them the, the, the idea of the mafruq, which has already been decided. It doesn't matter what time and what space you're in. Yes, he makes these parallels in the tafsir. So um, um, the unfolding point of view is proper to the Sharia uh, with its moral answerability and so forth. And that is promulgated by prophets. The Sharia is pro promulgated by prophets. The accomplished point of view is proper to the Qiyama and is presided over by Imams. And I would also suggest that there is another way in which I sent Shahrastani harks forward to what is about to happen 10 years after his death in 1164, the Qiyama, which is his theory of Naskh, of abrogation, which he returns to often. Uh, he is very Sharia conscious himself, I have to say. He sees uh, the religious law as a kind of blueprint for the Qiyama in some ways. Um, but um, he's very clear in his teaching on abrogation that it is not an, an annulment of the prior law, but it's perfection. So it's a subsumptive model of abrogation. In annulling law, you are not negating it. You are converting it into a further stage which contains the prior stage. I think this is relevant to the Qiyama, actually. Uh, thank you. You you already mentioned uh, several uh, uh, several uh, uh, issues which are connected to the to the terminology used by Shah Rastani mm. uh, to his technical terms. Uh, are there uh, something in the language of uh, technical language used by Shah Rastani which echoes more directly in uh, Nizari literature? Sorry. Yeah, I think this is this is this is one of those fascinating things that it took me a while to figure out. There is a there are two terms that Shahristani frequently uses. These are Hanifiya and Sabwa. So mm. in the second part of the Melal, Shahristani talks about the people who follow the pristine faith, now connected very clearly to Ibrahim, and then the people, the Sabians. Now the Sabah when he, he offers an interpretation of that, are the Saba are the people who want to go uh, and, and know God through speculating in the world in which they live. But the Hanifi are the people who believe in the intermediary of a person. And that goes back to the story of Ibrahim. Now, it sounds a little bit contradictory because in the stories that we see that now, this story is narrated in by al muayyad Fatina Shirazi, by uh, Qazi al Noman. You find it in the Paradise of Submission as well, the story that Ibrahim uh, uh, comes out of his cave and he started, starts looking at the stars and the moons and then the sun. And then he believes that I need something, I need a guide which does not set, which does not disappear, referring to the Imam who's always to be, to be Hayy al Hazir and Qaim. Now, what he uh, argues here is that all of these uh, uh, these these other ranks, they, they, because the moon and the star and the sun are referring to the ranks of the teachers that they've got, they fade away and it is only the imam of the time who's always present and that person is the manifestation of God's command. And then there's a phrase that he uses in the, in the majlis 
And that phrase is also used uh, late in later Nizari text, the, and it says, al hanifiyatun yabatul rijal. Now, in the original text, which were published before, in, uh, not in my edition, uh, Jalalin Aini had missed, uh, read the uh, text in the, from the manuscript. So he had written that as al hanifiyatun nabahatul rijal, which was very clearly, if he had read the, the, the tafsir, he would have known that the term is niyaba, which is deputyship, which is the intermediary of a person, of an individual, which brings us to the, to the term of tashakhus. So the oh. imam, becomes the embodiment of the truth. If you were going to show the Imam in a physical, the, the truth in a physical form, it would point to the person of the Imam of the time, which is the distinction between Hanifiyya and Sabwa. So Toby, mm -hmm. if you want to add a few more things on this. Um, but Shahrasani is somehow obsessed with the Sabian religion about uh, 60 pages of the modern edition by Mohanna and Faour of the Book of Religions. 60 pages of it is dedicated to this debate between the Hanifs and the Sabians. Um, it, it's a slightly complicated story. I mean, you've, 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 you've already discussed it to some extent, but the, the main thing is that uh, Sabianism is a kind of heres heresiographical construct that Shahristani uses. Uh, through which he categorizes a great deal of non-Abrahamic religion throughout its history. Um, this is, is a slightly sort of strange association. He takes the idea initially from this surviving Chaldean pagan community in Haran, in northern Mesopotamia, east, eastern Turkey now. Um, they survived just about into Shahristani's lifetime um, to defend themselves uh, at the time of the Abbasid Caliph Ma'mun, uh, they identify themselves with the mysterious Sabi'ah mentioned in the Quran as a protected community, <coughs> as, a, as, as a respectable religion. On that basis, uh, Shah Rastani has to take seriously that it is in its origins uh, uh, an authentic revealed religious system. And he says that it was promulgated initially by the prophet, sages, Hermes Trismegistus and Agathodaimon, Idris and Seth in Islamic parlance. But they deviated and he actually maps out their various stages of deviation in the tafsir. Their primary deviation through which they become the perennial opponents of Abrahamic monotheism is, as you said, they, in, well, they insist that the mediators between hum human beings and God cannot simply be other human beings. They must be spiritual in their constitution. So he sometimes calls them the Ashaba Ruhaniyat, the adherents of spirit beings. Um, we might think of them as angels, but in practice what it refers to is the astral religion of the Haranians, the, the, this uh, Chaldean pagan community. So they propitiated planetary spirits as their means of access to God. Hanifism comes to correct this um, throughout its history. Um, and it insists that uh, human beings are mediators with God. Um, and of course, in Shahrastani's understanding, the ultimate flowering of the Hanif, the, uh, the Hanif faith, Abrahamic monotheism, is Islam. And he notes that the Islamic confession of faith turns out to be two confessions. It's pristine monotheism, no God but God. Uh, but it is also Muhammad is the messenger of God. And this is uh, emphasizing that human beings uh, act as mediators with God. Uh, to say something slightly controversial, though, I do think that his prophetology and his imamology bears the trace of Sabianism. He takes on their view to some extent because he distinguishes two aspects to these elect human beings. Uh, there is Moshebaha or similarity, from which point of view they are other human beings, but there is also Mubayana, dissimilarity, from which point of view they they transcend the rest of humanity. If you like, they're almost spiritual beings. Um, 
But he traces this idea that <coughs> monotheism goes with, uh, with, with confessing the special relationship of the one true God with certain elect human individuals throughout humanity. And he points out in the Quran and thereby the Bible that God is often referred to in an idafa relationship with these elect individuals, a genitive relationship, the God of Moses, the Lord of Moses and Aaron, the God of Abraham and Isaac and Jacob and so forth. He's very insistent on this. Yeah. Yeah, if I may add one, one quick sentence uh, to, to make it a little bit simpler than the rather sophisticated language that, that Toby used. Uh, so that it's, it's very interesting that throughout the Majlis, He's using these terms Hanifiyah and the Saba as some kind of code words. If you want to simplify it for him, no, in, in the Ismaili context, the Ismailis are Hanifi because they, they believe in the, in the teaching of the Mu'allim and this, that, that Mu'allim is the personification of the truth for them. And all others, the people who do not accept this, this intermediate, the, 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 the mediation of that Imam, that, that Rajul uh, that, that, that he's using, Become the people of the of of the of the Saba. These these are the, the followers of the same faith. So in a sense, it also falls into the category of Tazat Tarattub and Wahdat. So it, it the, the people of Wahdat are the people who acknowledge this this pristine faith and the people who follow the doctrine of Qiyamat and who accept the teaching of the Imam Al Hayy Al Hazar Al Qaim. Uh, thank you and. Um, uh, Perhaps the, the last question for discussion, because I'm, I'm mindful of our time limits. Uh, uh, Shahrastani's intellectual identity can be sometimes confusing. Uh, what was his position with regard to different currents of thought that existed at his time? Um, do you want me to answer this? Yeah. Uh, the, um, well, I maintain that um, his Ismaili thought actually does bear a strong trace from Asharism for a start. Uh, he does criticize Asharism from various points of view, but it, 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 its trace is clearly there in his Ismaili thought. Um, and uh, he's fiercely critical of the Mu'tazilites. His whole relationship with philosophy is a very intriguing question here. Uh, falsafa. Well, he of course is a famous critic of Ibn Sina, but uh, philosophy is not, uh, is not identical to Avicennism, it's not coterminous with this movement of Avicenna and philosophy. Um, he He takes over this phrase from Nasr al-Khusro, the title of Nasr al-Khusro's book, the Jami' al-Hikmatayn, the merger of the two wisdoms, namely religion and philosophy. And he presents his Ismaili system as the merger of religion and philosophy. So he does have a strongly philosophical sensibility. Um, and, and his system responds to, to many philosophical issues as well. But... Um, Yes, I think he did have a, you know, as, as one would think, he has a, a, an, an Ashari persona in public and, and he is definitely an Ismaili in private. Uh, so, yes, this is what I'd say. Yeah, perhaps one thing, quick comment that I would add is that we know from the Majlis that he, he is, he's mentioned a, no, a number of people. So when he refers to the philosophers, hmm. he calls them the Ahl al-Nazar, the same term that Tusi uses in the Sayyid al-Suluq, which is on the subject of the knowledge of God. But other areas, he doesn't have any issues. I mean, even if, if when we look at the Musara, when he's critical of Ibn Sina, the main area of contention is the knowledge of God. How can you can you do that? And it is in contradistinction with that formulation that Hassan Sabba has. And it's very interesting that there is a tension here. We know that Tusi loves uh, Ibn Sina, and we also know that Shah Rastani doesn't like Ibn Sina. So he writes a critique of Ibn Sina, then Tusi writes a critique of the critique of Ibn Sina, and we could see this tension going on until the end of the Alamut period that. 
as much as Shahristani is trying to keep Ibn Sina away from Ismailism, Tusi is trying to drag him in. And it's quite evident in the language of the, uh, of the Rawzai Taslim, particularly in the opening chapters, you see the influence of Ibn Sina there. But as you move forward, you also see the influence of Shahristani. So it's a, it's, it's, it's a melting pot of Ibn Sina and Shahristani and Tusi, and at the same time, you're bringing them all together. So it's mm. kind of an uneasy coexistence, if you like. <laughs> thank you very much, and uh, uh, thank you for, for this uh, uh, stimulating discussion. And uh, uh, we have some time for questions now. Uh, please. Uh, yeah, please. Thank you very much. Uh, my name is Otan Bekov. And uh, today I have two questions. I try to make them short. The first one is about uh, that Belush uh, said about uh, the story of Hel and uh, Musa, and you mentioned about the, uh, the notion of time. But there is another thing which is uh, actually akhbar or knowledge, because in the story, uh, yeah, when uh, uh, Musa claims that uh, uh, Hel can find him Saul steadfast, then uh, Hezre responds that how can you be steadfast, steadfast Saul when you don't have an Akhbar or knowledge? So uh, what's your view about instead of time uh, to move it towards knowledge? Yeah, because it is not about, uh, at least according to my understanding, yeah, not about time but about knowledge which is more important, even not knowledge, but just yeah, And the second question is just about uh, uh, how to make uh, Sharistani uh, to specifically make them like uh, being a smiley. I don't know to what extent it is important to know. But uh, the thing is that uh, just by uh, using a Muharim Sultek or like this, uh, we know that uh, it was refuted uh, by Ghazali very professionally. Uh, that uh, even when he said that Ismaili is saying that, uh, yeah, you need Muharim Sultek, we say that our Muharim Sultek is Prophet Muhammad. And when you said that, but he is dead, we also said that, but your Imam is also absent. So, in this case, uh, by using just these terms, in Shahristani or in other art scholars, we still cannot claim that uh, they are Ismailis. What are the other, probably more strong uh, evidence that they are Ismaili? Yeah, so uh, let me go back to your first question. So in terms of this idea of knowledge, I think it is interconnected with the, with the element of time. Because when Khazr is telling Musa, and then he says, how can, you, how can you be patient with me when you do not have knowledge of this? So this knowledge is the knowledge of the decrees which go beyond the limitation of time and space. So the three examples which, 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 which he gives in terms of, for example, his killing that young child and claiming that he's going to become a corrupt person. And Musa argues that this hasn't happened yet. He says, for you, it hasn't happened. For me, it has already happened. I know that this is what is going on. It's diff it is happening in a different world. You do not have the knowledge of it. The knowledge that things can happen without the element of time. So that is the, the key. Uh, so it's interconnected with the same idea. Now, in terms of the idea of Shah Rastani being, being, being an Ismaili or a senior figure of it, it's not, of course, it has nothing to do with just the idea of Ma'alim Sadat. There are so many things, so many things which are found in the Milal, in the, uh, in, in the, in the, uh, Mafatih, in the, in the, in the Tafsir, and also in the Majlis, which are exclusively Ismaili ones. I mean, the Mafrugh and Mustanaf, the Tazad, the Tarattub and Wahdat, these are the terminologies that no other person other than Ismailis ever used. I mean, going back to the critique of Shah Rastani, Shah Rastani uh, of Al-Ghazali, Al-Ghazali was referring to Imam Ma'asum, while uh, I have not seen anything in the language of uh, uh, Hassan al-Sabbat to refer to it as Imam Ma'asum, he was referring to it as Imam al -Sad. The idea of Isma was also, a, 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 it had a different narrative in the Alamut period. But beyond that point, the terminology that Shah Rastani uses is the terminology that only Nazari Ismaili uses. No other community uses them. 
So it, it would be very strange to believe that it could have come from a different perspective. And as uh, Toby mentioned when he's, when he's talking, uh, when he's criticizing as Shia al-Amma, as Shia al-Muntazara, he's making a distinction between the Ismailis and the Assangeries there. So he's very openly critical of them. So uh, by, as, as Toby mentioned, by a sheer process of elimination, no other community would be left other than the Zali Ismailis unless we could imagine that there was a community of believers around Shahrastani, which included him and a handful of people and nobody knew about them, which is very odd. It sounds very strange. In what kind of a universe you could create a community of believers?